Great. So today we start, thank you very much, that'll do. Today we start a new series. Welcome to everyone that's in the prisons. Great that you are joining us. Great to have you online. Of course, our Bury St. Edmunds campus. They're cheering if you're not. And Colchester, we love you guys. Happy Father's Day to you. And of course, here in the room in Cambridge. The title of the series that we're starting today is RPMS or RPMs. I'll explain in a few minutes what that's about. But I want to read a verse from the scriptures, which is from the book of Ecclesiastes. I think it might come up on the screen here. And I'm just going to read it from one version, but I've got it here in seven different versions. It says this, and here's my little uh, illustration as well. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10 says this. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but strength will bring success. Let's read it from the English Standard Version. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, or she, but wisdom helps one to succeed. And then I'm going to read from one last version. Pick up a version, any version. New American Standard Bible, NESB. If the axe is dull and he or she does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of bringing success. Here is an axe that we've had in the family for many years. I don't know whether it was my dad's or my uh, father-in-law's. can't remember where it came from. It's actually a little bit loose on the top here. I was going to do a bit of a competition, and I was going to buy a new one, a new axe, and a, uh, 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 this old axe, but health and safety wouldn't allow me in my own mind. I thought, this, this could come flying off <laughs> and do a very nasty injury. And it's hard to get axes sharpened these days. If you're in the room here, there's a man over here, Matthew Courtney Jones, who actually does it. And if you need any help, he will, I'm not his agent, but I'd like you to sharpen this for me, if you wouldn't mind, and, and give me a quote later. A dull axe is hard work. If anyone's ever tried to chop wood, let's stay with the stereotype. And if you men in the room ever tried to chop wood for your barbecue, it's hard work. Same if any of you women have tried to chop wood for your barbecue. It's hard work. It's exhausting. According to this Bible verse here, it's just not wise. The wise way to work is sharpen your axe. Did I hear an amen? amen? Thank you for listening today. I really appreciate you being here. You can all go home now and sharpen your axes. <laughs> of course, the the picture that we're talking about is not simply in relation to a physical axe. It can be in any area of life, our own lives. If we're not sharp, we'll burn out. There's a very, it's becoming super popular, this phrase now, isn't it? Quite rightly, in our 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, switched on society, burnout's a big deal. Burnout is defined in this way. Burnout is a state of emotional, physical, mental, I'm going to carry this all the way through my message today, mental, spiritual, I added spiritual. Burnout is a state of emotional, physical, mental, spiritual exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. I've been close to burnout. I don't think I've ever fully burnt out, but I've been close. Anyone else? Or maybe some of you, you've experienced, or online, on Colchester, Barry, you've experienced burnout. Emotional, physical, mental, spiritual exhaustion. I've got some good news for you. It's not God's will for you to burn out. I should have had an amen for that one as well. Clearly, I'm preaching better than you're responding. It's not God's will. Now, don't be condemned in that because we live in a fallen world and we have frail humanity. So no condemnation. But according to the Scriptures, John 10 verse 10 says, I have come that you may have life and life in all its fullness. That is the will of God. According to the Scriptures, it says this, 
This is Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's only by being yoked to Jesus. I don't know why everyone doesn't burn out if they're not attached to Jesus. Because it's only by being attached, connected, yoked to Jesus. Because Jesus really is the answer, my brothers and sisters. He really is. Whatever your question is, being yoked to Jesus, then our burden can be lighter. We can live this full life. See, our example for a life that is not burned out, but is, and I'm going to use this word because it's a really good word. It's used a lot in our world today, and it's particularly used in theological circles. It's the will of God for you and I to flourish. What a lovely word. It kind of has like a, a, a Nike stick to it, doesn't it? Flourish. Everyone say Flourish. That's the will of God for you. I've come that you may have life and life in all its fullness. And the one who is the example of a flourishing life for us is Jesus himself. I wanted to show you a, a YouTube clip today by a, a guy called Andy Crouch. who does a definition of flourishing. But unfortunately, if we play it, we lose the stream the way it works. So I, I'm just going to have to read a bit to you. It sounds much better with his voice and the way he says it. But... He describes human flourishing as this. He said, this phrase, human flourishing, is tremendously valuable, but we need to infuse it with Christian content or else we're just going to borrow assumptions of the world around us about what flourishing really is. Listen to this. For us as Christians, the measure of human flourishing is the incomparable human life of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is our example, and Jesus is our standard. And it's not for us to say we cannot do it, because we don't have just our own strength to do it in. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have the Scriptures. We have the church. We can flourish in life. As for Christians, Jesus is our example. Jesus is our practice of what flourishing life is. And it's not just our picture of flourishing is for an individual, but actually the most striking thing about Jesus is that he is flourishing everywhere he went and in everyone he encountered. We learn some things that flourishing is not meant to be. This is good news. Ready for this? To be flourishing, you do not have to be affluent. Oh, I thought flourishing went by how much I've got in my bank account, didn't you? It's not flourishing. Jesus had enough to meet all his needs, but he didn't have big reserves. To be flourishing, well, he did have huge reserves, actually, a cattle on a thousand hills, but it wasn't in the bank like you and I think it should be. To be flourishing, he says, you don't even have to own a home. All you 20 and 30-somethings that think you're never going to own a home, it's all right. That won't be a definition of you flourishing. Jesus is the example, and he never owned a home. I know, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We're talking about the human Jesus, who we know was God too. To be flourishing, you don't even have to have a long life. Jesus was crucified at 33. You, to be flourishing, you don't even have to be popular. All was well thought of. To be flourishing is something deeper than that. And the life of Jesus involves a profound truthfulness to God and to other people. So a flourishing life, and this is a high bar, is that of Jesus. Where you see a life that was constantly truthful consistently attending to whatever person was in front of him, whether that person was powerful or evidently powerless. And that brought flourishing in the lives of others. See, we're not going to speak about for these next five weeks how not to burn out. That's a negative. We're going to speak about how to flourish. How to flourish in life. And the example, Jesus. Jesus.
Jesus. You see, Christ-centeredness is not a little phrase that we use as part of our three C's, C3. Christ-centeredness is the only way to live. It's exhausting any other way. We read the scripture last week about the persecuted church. The apostle Paul said this, for me to live is Christ. Goes on to say, to die is gain. But remember that first part, for me to live is Christ. Many years ago, I read this book. It's really old now. I don't know what what year was this one produced here, if I can see it printed on the front. It's entitled, some of you may know it, the, the, the habits of highly, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This is 1988, this book. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey was not a uh, Christian. He was uh, actually, I think that this is right from my memory, uh, was it a Mormon he was? It's a great, great book. 15 million copies sold. And he uses an analogy in there in one of his chapters very similar to the Acts. It's all about a saw. You write, this is the story he has in chapter 7. He says, suppose you were to come upon someone in the woods working feverishly to saw down a tree. What are you doing, you ask? Can't you see, comes the impatient reply, I'm sawing down this tree. You look exhausted, you explain. How long have you been at it? Oh, five hours. And I'm beat. This is hard work. Well, why don't you take a break for a few minutes and sharpen that saw, you inquire. I'm sure it would go a lot faster. I don't have time to sharpen the saw, the man said emphatically. I'm too busy sawing. But if you'd sharpen the saw, you'd get through a lot quicker. Wisdom. He talks about working smarter, not harder. And do you know what for... Practices, habits, Covey identifies that if we're to keep a sharp saw, this is what he talks about. And then we're going to read you a Bible verse again. He says we need to be physically, mentally, relationally, and spiritually sharp. Physically, mentally, relationally, and spiritually. Or just flip it round a bit. Relationally, are. Physically, P. Mentally, M. Spiritually, S. And that, my brothers and sisters, is what we're going to look at these next few weeks. We want you to flourish. We want you to flourish. And if you're to flourish, we really need to get the RPMSs in our life right. Some would call it self-care. That's become a big industry. It's bigger than self-care because it's not just about you. It's about living like Jesus so that everyone around you can flourish as well as you. Because if you follow the RPM message, guess what? Your wife, your husband, your children, your neighbor, everyone will benefit. And we're not here. If you just live for yourself, you will die on the vine. There's no life living for yourself. I've come that you might have life, but our life is meant to be the stream of living water that flows out to everyone around us. Keep the axe sharp. Sharpen the saw. R-P-M-S. Now, I'm going to read one verse. This really is what we're basing the next few weeks on. And this verse is a verse that tells us something about what Jesus did during really the years from 12 to 30. The what theologians call the silent years of Jesus, the hidden years. What did Jesus, we, have, we know he was born, there's a lot of detail around his birth. And we know that he went to Egypt probably in that first couple of years. And then we hear nothing, except for one incident when he was 12, when he went to the temple. And then he starts his ministry at 30. So really from 12 to 30, silent. What was Jesus doing? Some think he was building furniture because he was a carpenter. The word that's used for carpenter, he may not have been, by the way, he might have just been more of a general builder. We, we just don't know. 
Listen to this verse, because this is what tells us something that happened in Jesus' life between 12 to 30. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 52. One verse. So for these next four weeks, we're going to squeeze everything out of this verse that we can. It says this, and Jesus, this is what he did, 12 to 30, and Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and with man or humanity. See, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and with people. Stephen Covey realized that the way to flourish in life is our PMS. That's what Jesus did. Look at that. Jesus increased in wisdom. Let's call that his mental life. In stature, that's his physical life. In favor with God, that's spiritual life. And with man, or better said, people, humanity. That's his relationship life. And in those years, he grew in all of those areas. Wisdom, areas, wisdom mentally, stature, physically, favor with God, spiritually, and with men, relationally. So we're going to unpack each of those, and we're going to assess ourselves, and we're going to talk in small groups, which you can get on your YouVersion apps, that are there, some questions together. How are we doing relationally? How are you doing physically? How are you doing mentally? How are you doing spiritually? My temptation would be to say the spiritual is the most important, but if any one of those areas is neglected, it will affect them all. Because we're not separated out. If you physically, if you're not up to par, it will affect you spiritually. Anybody know that? Mentally, if you're suffering, it affects your spiritual life. So we want to look at all of those areas. I'd like to go through them all today, but time will not allow me to do that. I've just got a few minutes left, and I want to focus on one thing that the Holy Spirit spoke to me about as I was preparing. First area is about relationships. How are you doing with your closest relationships? You know, even marriages can grow stale. Relationships do not thrive without work. My wife and I have just been on holiday to Sicily. We had a great time. Driving down the Sicilian roads, and my wife says to me, so we're just enjoying our time. She says, uh, Have you got any disappointments in life? (laughs) It's a big stadium we all like now. Have you got any disappointments in life? I'm on holiday. (laughs) I said, I'm not answering you. (laughs) Okay, she's just asking. (laughs) So we got back and I said to her, as we were driving along one day, I thought I'm going to say the same question, but I'm going to, have you got any regrets in life, Ange? You have to ask, and I'm not going to tell you, by the way, some of those answers. I've got one regret in life, um, and I'm not going to share it with you. <laughs> but there you go. And that was it. I maybe should have shared it with you, but I, I have one regret. But I did say this to my wife. The one thing I never regret is marrying you. Oh. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Great relationships aren't a fluke. They take work. Make sure you're intentional. Now we're going to unpack that some more. The second area here is physically. Physical, but the Apostle Paul said this, for well, physical training is of some value, but godliness is value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and life to come. Now, if we can want to be dismissive, you can say, Paul says physical training is of some value, and you can dismiss it. We all need the margins, the regularity of exercise and diet in our life if we're to stay healthy. We know we can make gods of any of these things, but all of them in a the right balance are important for us. And in our 24-hour, seven-days-a-week world, these are the kind of things that can slip off. And if you physically are not up to where you can be, it can affect you spiritually. One guy I love, and I'd recommend him to you, that writes about this kind of thing so well because he wrote on burnout a lot, is a man called Carrie Newoff. 
He's from Canada. He's a, a commentator. And a couple of things that he talks about is the importance of managing your energy in a day rather than being all on, 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 on. When are you at your best? So when you know you're at your best, and some people are night owls, I know, and other people are in the morning, they're up in the, with the lark, they're there, then do the most important things. Manage your energy, because do those that are most important for the day to be done when you have the most energy. Bring your best to it. I am awful in the mornings very early on. I really am. I've just been fishing with my brother. My brother's 70. Have you watching, Dave? Great to have you online. He's 75. I hope you don't mind me saying his age. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> 75 years age. He's a morning person. So we've been fishing. Didn't do very well, did we? You know, but we did. I'm watching it. It's energetic in the mornings. What a pain. <laughs> but if that's where your energy lies, do the most important things there. One thing Karen you have talked about, and I just want to release any of you. I was watching someone the other day who went through the Google offices. And I noticed in America that he's working there, a friend of mine, and the Google offices had this on the door, the nap room. And I thought... If only we had space for that in the C3 center. <laughs> Carrie knew I've talked about <laughs> This is a word from God for some of you. Maybe the older you get, you appreciate it. It's okay to nap in the, ta- in the day. Be released in Jesus' name. <laughs> Go and lie down in your car. <laughs> some of you looking, that's the most energetic some of you have been. If you need, no, I'm not suggesting hours, five minutes, half an I got home yesterday afternoon, I lay down and I felt so much better for my 30 minutes nap before the family came home than if I'd just driven four and a half, five hours. Napping is a gift from God. <laughs> now, don't do it at your desk. <laughs> Find the rhythm of life that works for you. And that's what I want to finish because time's gone. The Bible says this, that sleep is a gift from God. And until a few years ago, I never had a problem with sleeping. And then I lost the pattern. This is about three, four years ago, for ages. Some of you know about it because I had you pray for me. And it affected me. It affected me emotionally. It affected me physically and it affected me mentally and spiritually. I couldn't get this sleep pattern and I, I read all the stuff on sleep hygiene and what you do at night. Now, I'm sharing it now because some things you don't share until you've got the victory on because I'm sleeping really well right now and I have been doing probably for six, nine months. I did try sleeping tablets, went to the doctor and they gave me some, and I tried that, and knocked me out. But it didn't feel like it was sorting what was underneath. I've had some counseling, because was it anxiety? Actually, to be honest, I'm still in the midst of that counseling. Was it helping? Was it anxiety-induced, or, or was it the other way around, so that I would wake up, and then I'd, I'd feel anxious? I'd go out of my bedroom, I'd read. I've started reading novels. I now have a, a, a sleep going to bed routine uh, in order to relax more, and make sure that I'm, I'm ready for sleep. So I'm sleeping great right now. Still wake up in the night, but I go back to sleep. And the Bible says, like I said it before, sleep is a gift from the Lord. The Lord, it says it like this, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. And I am God's beloved. Oh, yes, I am. I've got no doubts about that. I know I am God's beloved. Oh, and by the way, so are you. So are you. You're beloved. Therefore, sleep is a gift from God. And when I've been struggling to sleep, that's what I've been quoting so often. 
The Lord gives his beloved sleep. Anyway, if I can introduce my friend Paul Belsey here. And ask Paul to come up and do something as we finish in a minute. There's a guy in America called Wayne Drain. Look at me, not at him. <laughs> Wayne Drain. And I saw this on YouTube. Wayne Drain has struggled the last few years to sleep. Wayne Drain is a worship pastor. And Wayne felt that God gave him a song in the night that would help him sleep. So I looked it up. I think it's called the sleep song. Google, Google it, but not now, please. <laughs> and what's been happening when Wayne's been singing this is people who have a problem to sleep have found that that next night they've been sleeping eight hours. Even some people have been falling asleep in meetings while he's been singing it. <laughs> and I listened to it and I thought, that's a beautiful song. But as I'm listening to it, another song came into my head that I felt was even more beautiful that over the years, a few years ago, really ministered to me. And I looked it up again on YouTube. And I closed my eyes in my study at home, and I felt so peaceful. Because I think it carries an anointing. Even more than Wayne Drains, if I may say it. And it was by a, a young man. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. Called Paul Bell. Paul Bell has been a friend for years. And he wrote this song years ago called Why You Sleep Tonight. And I've asked Paul, will he come and sing this over you? And at the end of this, I'm going to get up and we're going to have people here, if you're struggling with sleep, come forward. And I've asked, and he's going to sing it again. And I want you to flourish in life. And you can't without sleep. So if you're struggling, I want you to listen to the whole song first while you sleep tonight. And then afterwards I'll come up again, I'll explain, and we're going to lay hands on you. Anybody, it can be two of you. And you can hear this that Paul wrote while you sleep tonight. Thank you, Paul. what the night will bring who knows what joys what sorrows who holds our yesterdays and our tomorrows as I lay down my head Somewhere someone is waking Ground shakes and seas rise and Earth groans and earth cries and Some things are just beyond explaining And I find myself here praying May the light of heaven keep you warm And the voice of Jesus calm your storm May you know the peace that passes all understanding May you hear an answer when you call and the arms of angels break your fall And the Father watch over us all While we sleep tonight When answers can't be found When there are only questions 
I search my heart and find no suggestions. Except this sense that I must mourn with those who are mourning. And in the dark times, I pray that you'll find someone who shares your suffering. And tonight, while you are sleeping, may the light of heaven keep you warm. And the voice of Jesus calm your storm. Know the peace that passes all understanding. May you hear an answer when you call, and the arms of angels break your fall. And the Father watch over us all while we sleep tonight. While we sleep tonight. While we sleep tonight. While we sleep tonight. While we sleep tonight, may the light of heaven keep you warm, and the voice of Jesus calm the storm. May you know the peace that passes all understanding. when you call and the arms of angels break your fall and the Father watch over us all while we sleep tonight If you enjoyed this video today why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.